on of my interview with John Clore from Ford Performance. So we're going to get straight on into it. Part two. Let's go. But then something, I had an epiphany. Ford Racing was going along okay, and, and they said, well, we got to keep enthusiasts in clubs because they buy most of our parts. Right. Right? Right. So you got to stay connected with them. But the, the epiphany came when they asked me to do more content. I said, you can't get content about the Ford enthusiast, who you are, or your story, or your car story, by sitting at a desk in Dearborn. Yeah. You're so get that's to the people. Absolutely. So I figured, well, I can't go. Ford goes to lots of places. Yeah. But where they don't go is the everyday enthusiast who never goes to the Ford Nationals or Barrett Jackson or to Tulsa. His whole life is his own car show, is in his hometown club, and yeah. his hometown Ford dealer. Yeah. He goes to their cruises, and if Ford doesn't go there, he'll, they'll never meet Ford. Yeah. So I pitched this idea to some kid who was my boss, some guy named Henry Ford III. Mm, I think I heard of that guy. That yeah. those boy was the coolest guy to work for because he gets it. Yeah. So when I told him, he said, John, you have the wrong hair color and you're not the target market. I said, well, I, I submit to you there are a lot of millennials and young people who love Mustang, and I would also submit to you that if we encouraged the clubs to become the conduit to pass this torch, you would have an army of disciples. and you, They are already in your camp. Yeah. And all you have to do is, is, is support them. So he's the one that created the enthusiast outreach that I do. So, you know, 30 weekends a year I'm on the road at yeah, each month Ford hopefully coming up, and yeah. hundreds of Ford dealers have places where Ford will people they'll never meet, yeah. they'll never touch. And in the meantime, I wrote a couple of Mustang books. I've been on the History yeah. Channel. I've been on the Faster Horse movie. Uh, so my goal is to understand these aren't just cars. These are like when you buy a Mustang, it's, it's kind, kind of your family. Kind of well, it kind of comes a lifestyle. It does. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's not you, you're buying into a whole lifestyle. Yeah, and. The, you know, the cars may come and go, but the friends you make in the hobby, Jeff. Well, do you know how garage table discussion started? I need to know this. I came home from going with myself and Charlie Watson and some of our best customers and friends, who our customers usually become our friends. But we had gone to the Cavalcade Custom Show oh, yeah. at Cincinnati Very Convention cool. Center. Got home that afternoon, and I don't even know what made me think of this, but I thought, you know, I've got this set up out in my garage yeah. table, and I thought, I'm going to go out here, and I just decided to make a little video talking about what great car friends people are. And, and, and so people. I, yeah. And I posted it. Charlie comes to me, and he says, oh my God. He goes, that's great. He goes, you know, the whole concept of you just sitting in your garage is cool. talking about car stuff. He goes, you got to do something with this. And that's how it became. It's just oh, supposed dude. to be me sitting at the you know table in the garage talking about car stuff, having some people come in from guests here and there. I've been very lucky to have, uh, uh, in my area, even some great people, Jimmy Dinsmore and Tony Alonzo, for example, uh, and living close enough here yeah. to come up here. Yeah. I, I've been very blessed and, and blessed to have you today. And I, I can tell you that there are tons of guys, well, probably girls too, sitting out there right now going, I wish I was John Clore. That's a great job. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's, it is a great job if you don't ever want to cut your grass or see your children. Oh, no, that's true. And uh, luckily, my wife likes to come along with me. She's a great ambassador. Well, when she leaves, when I leave the tent to go photograph cars, she'll still be there. And yeah. so we, we are able to do that together. A lot of people don't want to be anywhere with their wives, they, they use the car to be away. <laughs> but um, I'm able to do that. Uh, and it, it, it's also something that I rely on my background as a writer. If you can't write and you don't know your car product, you're really not the guy to talk Ford's story. I'm more of a student of Ford history and of this car. Yeah. If any, if you meet anybody who tells you they know everything about Mustang, walk away. Yeah. Because um, you'll never stop learning. And then one of the reasons why I'm so glad, Jeff, that you came here to the Halderman Barn today is because the people I met in the hobby, like you're going to meet, uh, because of what you do. Um, they're the ones that open your eyes to the real history. And exactly. Look, I have 180 Mustang books at my house. The last thing I needed to do was write a Mustang. Yeah. But the reason I wrote it is because as a journalist, I knew there were things about Mustang's history that never got answered. Yeah. And how will you get those answers? As a journalist, you get no comment, no comment, no comment. But as a Ford person, when you work at Ford, and you're talking to a retiree, you're a different per They're talking yeah. to a different guy. Like yeah. me and you. Talking yeah. to your family. Your family. So yeah. we, can, we can talk. Yeah. So I started asking the really hard questions, all the things that, you know, that people would, growing up knowing Mustangs, first generation, 
second generation, third generation. Every generation of Mustang has a mystery that never got solved. So I wrote that first book, and when, after I wrote it, I, want, I was so curious to see if people are like me. Do they want to know what really happened? Oh, and yeah. how I found the answers wasn't in anything, any book, because of what's written, what is in the Benson Ford, is just what somebody had told the historian to write down. It's not really what happened. And I learned through SVT, through stories told about that, that things really happen that nobody really knows about. Yeah. So how do you do this, Jeff? You've talked to the people who were there. And one of the people who opened so many doors for me was one Gail Haldeman. Oh. And I, I gotta tell you, uh, when you can get doors open for you and it, it, your eyes put on your hobby in a different way, yeah, it changes yeah. you. So you're, as you meet other people, you're gonna change your perspective of the, the Mustang hobby yeah. and the Ford vehicles, and I did the same thing. Well, Gail, speaking of Gail, I mean, I have said this to multiple people, and, and I'm sure you can say, you know, verify this, but I felt like, you know, uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you, up until about, I don't know, five, six years ago, Gail Halderman, I'm like, who's that? I, I, I didn't know it, you know, and, and, and as I learned more, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this guy's got an unbelievable history yeah. that needs to be told. And I don't think Gail ever got the recognition that he probably deserved. He totally did not do yeah. that. As a matter of fact, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a job where you've done something really great, you came up with an idea, and your boss stole the idea, and they got credit for it, and you didn't. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, at a big corporation like Ford, Gail was a young kid out of date. Yeah. And he worked for one of the best uh, designers at Ford, Joe Oros. And the reason why he was put on this special Falcon project, because everybody else thought it wouldn't see the light of the day. Yeah. Think about 1965, every Ford was brand new. There was no money left. And everybody's working, to, he was working on a Galaxy as well with Mr. Oros. So there's no time for anything else. There's no money for anything. Yeah. But they, thanks to Hal Spurlick, whose idea was we need a car. And the reason why he knew we needed a car, because when Lee Iacocca became uh, a big shot at Ford, he got the chance to give his daughter a Ford for free. And he said, honey, you can drive anything for I get cars. And you know what she said? No, oh, I can. I don't like them. Yeah. What? <laughs> you don't like any? I don't want a Ford. Why? They're boring, daddy. They're boring, Daddy? Mm -hmm. That's what got Hal started and thinking, and then the idea of trying to, did you hear, think about 1962, we just came off the Etzel debacle in 1960. Yeah. Ford lost millions of dollars. Yeah. The last thing Henry Ford the second one was another new car, go away. Yeah. So it was a hard sell, but the genius of the idea, I'm putting it on the Falcon so it can actually make money, and the genius of the design, which is Gale's, and the genius of, of Lee Iacocca selling it an impossible, impossible sales job. Yeah. But he did it. Oh, yeah. And and then having the car built and selling, you know, in 18 months, selling a million cars. Who would ever dream that? Yeah. So, but Gail was basically the young kid. And when the press came down, into, and this is what I found out later, when the press came down to say, hey, well, tell us a story, the, his supervisor, David Ash, would push people aside. Well, we did this and I did that. And, and Gail's like looking, well, hey, well, are you as a young kid going to say your boss was, you know. Right. And if you ever get to the chance to go back and to read and listen to your interviews or anybody else's interviews with Gail, you'll notice one thing. Gail's a soft-spoken, he's not, he's not pushy, he's, um, he's survived 40 years in design. Yeah. And design is something you wear on your sleeve, and if people don't choose it, you feel angry, you leave. Well, and it's also, what have you done for me lately? You know. <laughs> yeah, you better, <laughs> yeah. what if your stuff isn't picked? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you're gone. Yeah. So his, he didn't say anything, just he just moved on. Yeah. And the reason why, so I write this book, and I go to the, I do my research, I go to the Benson Ford Library, I, go, I mean, I read every book there is, and it says David Ash in there with Charlie Phaneuf and Gail Haldeman mentioned as a also ran. And then I go to sell my book, I'm at the Roush Museum selling my book, I did a presentation on Mustang history, and a gentleman comes up with a uh, lady and he says, I said, would you like me to personalize this book for you, sir? And he says, yes, make it out to Gail Halderman. I'm going to get the Gail, the Gail Halderman? You know what he said to me? Why, do you know another one? <laughs> I said, oh, Mr. Halderman, no, I, I don't want you to buy it. He goes, no, I've already read it. I'm buying this for a friend. He goes, and if you, you ever go to the Dearborn Country Club? I go, oh, I can't get into the Dearborn. It's a private club. He goes, well, I can. And if you go with me for lunch, I'll tell you what you missed in your book. Uh -huh. Who wouldn't go to that? So that's what gave me the background. That's why I met Gail. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and during these background stories, I got to meet, I bugged him to meet Mr. Spurlock. 
because everybody who knows about Mustang history knows it wasn't the I Coca, it was not the father of the Mustang, it was Hal Spurlock, it was his idea. Mm -hmm. And Gail will tell you a story that was one of the best Gail stories. If you had been to this barn when Gail was still alive, he had people ask, what's your favorite I Coca story? He, and he said, well, I'd, Lee would come down in the morning and look at the cars to see the clays. I'm sure he's told you this. And we'd walk through, he always wanted to see what's new. So every like Wednesday or Thursday morning, here comes Hal Spurlock running downstairs and he puts a uh, note card in Lee's uh, pocket of a suit coat and walks off. And Gail just didn't say anything. Well, after weeks go by, Spurlick coming down there put a note card, Gail couldn't take it anymore. Finally, he had the gumption to ask Mr. Iacocca, which is not like Gail, yeah. to say, excuse me, Lee, um, what is Hal Spurlick putting in your pocket every week? Like he's done it every week. And I go to last, oh, oh, takes his hand. Oh, ask Spurlick, he, those are his ideas. He goes, he has ideas every week? And he goes, yeah, the problem is he thinks they're all good. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how Spurlick and, and Iacocca were joined at the hip. And, you know, the, the whole Mustang thing, because they were, they were convinced this car was going to make it. Yeah. But they knew it had to be super special. And when, when Dave Ash would draw something on that, on that clay or put something on the, the chart, and Joe Ross, who put that on there? And Gail said, well, Ash, he goes, take that off. You know, and Gail worked, Gail worked on that kitchen table design and brought it in and out of all those 22, 24 designs, Lee Iacocca picked his. Yeah. And then, you know, he and Oros were actually competing with each other. It was Joe's on one side and Gail's on the other. They switched it just to make sure Mr. Iacocca got it right. And he kept picking Gail. So I said, Gail, why didn't you say something? All these years you're... And he said, because it wasn't my place. I just moved on. And that's why I said to myself, if I'm going to spend any time with Gail, it's going to be... He deserves the yeah. credit. Now... He gives credit for Charlie. He said, I just did that profile. Charlie Finuff did the front end. And Jerry Mallinson, who's still alive. Jerry's yeah. from Louisiana. He said, the rear end we did at the studio in one night. Yeah. And Gail, if you look in this museum, you'll see he's fascinated with three taillights. You look at his original clay three. So when they rejected the three taillights, the only time Gail got upset. And he said, why can't I have the three? It's imperative. They said, the Falcon has one bulb. So if you look at a Falcon, a 65 Mustang taillight, you notice they took silver paint and made it look like there were three lenses, but there's one ball. Yeah. I and mean, it wasn't until 67 he was able to put in his three. Uh, so those stories, Jeff, they can only come from Gail. Yeah. And when I first saw him and met him, I, I realized this is why this is important. Yeah. And, and me personally, I, I, I've been one of those, always been one of those kind of people that I love to be able to sit and talk with, you know, older generations to, to learn, you know, and uh, and, and I'm always fascinated, you know, and you being from Detroit, you might appreciate this, but like for me, I was also a musician for years. Okay. And I loved the story, and I don't know if you've heard of this, but uh, they did a movie called In the Shadows of Motown. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And to hear the stories of the guys that actually were the background guys yeah. that played on how many? Millions of hits. Millions of hits. They were big. For Motown. Yeah, they were. But nobody knew who they were. Yeah. And that's kind of, yeah, it is. kind of the same and, and thing. Yet, and yet Motown was so famous, but these names were lost in obscurity. Right. It's not fair to them. Right. Their contribution to that, to yeah. that music world. Yeah. And it wasn't fair to Gail. Yeah. And, and the reason why I even bothered was because that kind of, it kind of bothered me when, you know, when, and like I said, when Ford Racing then was disbanded and they said, well, you know what? You got our Team RS in Europe building the RS. You got SVT doing the, the Shelby thing. You got to Ford Racing doing the parts. You got, that's too, why don't you all get in the same sandbox yeah. and work together? Yeah. So that's why the idea behind Ford Performance came along. Yeah. And I said, why don't you put everybody, just be on the same page, so when you do a part, it fits in an export model and an import model. Right. Racing builds stuff that marketing sells. And I remember when I was at SVT, Ford Racing was building their own Mustang stuff that didn't interchange with SVT stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So like the FR, the FR cars, the FR 500 cars, those, those were... Ford Racing's vehicle. So I get it, but I don't understand why uh, people don't, like you said, when you're when I was younger, I, the it was the older guys that taught me the most. I learned more in my careers in journalism and at Ford yeah. from the, a mentor. Yeah. They're the ones that care, because they've been there. Yeah. So it, to me, that's why it makes sense. Think about it, that yeah. us in the hobby now, can with young people coming into the hobby and if they're gonna love cars like we are, or they're gonna treat them like a transportation pod that they click on their, they can do that. But I feel sorry for them if they don't experience the feeling of a Mustang with 
with the wind in your hair and the V8 singing. There's just something about uh, America, about freedom, yeah, about that experience that we don't want to lose because it's such a part of our hair. Well, there you have it. Part two of my interview with John Clore from Ford Performance. Join me tomorrow for part three. And remember, the next day, part four. Four-part episode, special edition of Garage Table Discussions on the Road. Hey, thanks for joining us. <laughs>